Welcome to Care Talk. I'm David Williams from Health Business Group, and I'm here today with John Driscoll, CEO of CareCentrics. Welcome back, John. It's great to be here, David. I didn't know if we were going to be able to come back. This is our second episode, and I thought maybe last month after the Republicans were so busy tearing down the Affordable Care Act and failed, that would be it. We'd have nothing left to talk about. No, healthcare is a little bit too much like Bill Murray's Groundhog Day. The, the, we, we still have the same big problems, and unfortunately, frankly, the same stilted and uh, stuck dialogue in D.C. I fear that we're going to be going back and forth with this for a while. Uh, it's enormously frustrating. So speaking of frustrating and fun, let's talk about Medicaid, one of our favorite topics. So Medicaid expansion was obviously a key part of the Affordable Care Act, and Medicaid has really been under attack by Republicans, and a lot of states did not expand Medicaid. And now in the midst of Medicaid uh, cuts being proposed in Washington by the Republicans, you see some action actually in the red states of now expanding Medicaid. What's that about? Well, I think it's because people are not talking about what they're talking about. I mean, the reality is that Medicaid expansion was a sensible way to deal with the challenges that the working poor have getting health care. And it actually is an extremely easy way to leverage coverage. If you don't cover people, it's not like they don't get care, David. They end up going right back to the hospital, and you and I and all the commercial covered payers end up paying for it either way. So it's the expansion was really about including people in the system who are already using the system and paying it for them more sensibly. So I think what's happening is now that the Republicans are in charge, they can do more of the right thing. It'll be interesting to see what, what occurs because I think there are going to be probably some Medicaid cutbacks that come along and every state, Republican or Democrat, is going to be trying to figure out how to deal with that because it's so important to the budgets. Well, I think that the, the optimistic way to look at this is that the there is, there is a substantial amount of flexibility that the feds are, are pitching around the state Medicaid programs. And honestly, healthcare is so local and so idiosyncratically local with different needs that there's, a, there's, a, there's the happy path where the, that flexibility is provided to states with more funds to do the right thing. Um, and I think that the, the, the challenge is to get beyond the ideology and the rhetoric and get folks to sit down and actually try to solve this problem. But it's not just a federal versus a state uh, uh, solution. And I actually think that the, the focus on Medicaid, where it's constructive, is going gonna, is gonna to potentially provide some, some neat new solutions for some of those red states. Well, I'd like to see that, but I also worry that uh, when you give more flexibility, it ends up being used in an ideological or punitive way, like drug testing or work requirements for Medicaid recipients, which requires a lot of effort to track and doesn't have much of an impact. I mean, I'd like to see some more real innovations, which would include things like alternative payment models, new ways of structuring care, new ways of delivering care. Do you see any, are you optimistic that that can happen with more flexibility? Well, I th let's talk about fear versus, 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 versus hope. The fear side says, um, we're going to give the states more flexibility we're, and we're not going to give them any more money to pay for it. In fact, we're going to reduce it. I mean, there are some proposals in their current rep uh, Republican proposal that will take $80 billion out of Medicaid. That's not flexible. Um, that's just unfair. Uh, those states need those funds to provide care today. There have been some states, like Arkansas, that have worked on some bundled payments that, that have been pretty, pretty effective in the Medicaid program. And I think, I think what we would like is more of that. So flexibility to reform, but enough money to pay the bills. You know, a separate topic, but I think it's related, which is the opioid crisis, which is yeah. really dramatic. And you saw it on the campaign trail. I mean, this is something that really affects every state and people really of all socioeconomic classes uh, is this opioid crisis. Now, we hear Trump talking it up on the campaign trail, but I haven't been that impressed with what he's been doing since he got into office about it. No, I, I, I think we are slow walking a crisis, which is really super dangerous. I mean, there's three things that I think have to happen here. We need to hold the drug companies that got us here to account. We also have to kind of look at you know, distribution and retailers as being somewhat responsible. If you look at uh, counties like Mingo County in West Virginia, they have thousands of tons of, of, of opioids going to cities with hundreds of potential patients. The total residents are in the thousands and the pills are in the tens of thousands. We could, we could lock down a lot of those problems today if we were more aggressive. And we can't afford to slow walk it. It's crippling in a lot of these industrial states. And I think it's a time for action. What I worry about is that some of the things that Trump has done 
both directly on the opioid crisis and then if you look at his appointments are kind of going against that. So if you look at Scott Gottlieb at FDA, you know, his position has really been about allowing more prescribing of opioids and Jeff Sessions, uh, you know, in, in Justice Department focusing on kind of a, you know, get tough on crime and, and separating people into the, the drug abusers versus the patients that, that need the medication. I think those are those are troubling signs. Well, I think Sessions is in the is in the last century. I mean, we, we don't have enough money for drug treatment, and we've got a generation that needs it. Um, Sessions is focused on pot. We should be focused on opioids, hard drugs, and the, and the narco cartels. It just feels like it's amateur hour from a from a from a DOJ perspective. I'm actually a little bit more hopeful about Scott Gottlieb. I think he's a pro. I think he's been around the industry a lot, and he's got relationships. Uh, uh, across the area. If he's got a blind spot in opioids, we've got to fix that right now because it is a crippling problem in West Virginia and Vermont and in, in a lot of the industrial states of the, of the Northeast, but it will continue to grow throughout the U.S. And we can actually do a lot more if we're more aggressive about shutting down and monitoring distribution uh, and providing treatment and opportunity for folks to get treated. I think that Chris Christie, for example, has been very open about the need to, for the federal and the states to leverage, put more resources and invest in taking care of our brothers and sisters who are in crisis because this is a devastating addiction. Well, I hope you're right, and one way to look at it will be what sort of general is appointed to lead this fight, and I mean Surgeon General. You know, Surgeon well, General has been the president, dismissed. The president we'll see seems to like generals. <laughs> yeah. Maybe he'll put a real general in now. Well, it, 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 if you look at his appointment, some of the best are generals, and so it appears that, he, the, that we get pretty, pretty good qualification when you use the word general and they, get, they have interviews. But no, I, I, um, I, I actually think that for the opioid crisis, it's got to be a combined uh, uh, leadership attack, and there's got to be more of a sense of urgency. Uh, frankly, it's embarrassing that we are where we are, uh, and we could do more right now, but we need to get focused on the right problem, which is shutting down distribution and getting people care, and not on the, uh, not on the corner cases uh, of, 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 of putting together a commission. We actually know more about how to solve this problem right now. We're just not acting on it. No, I agree with you. Well, speaking of, of generals and others in the military, let's talk about veterans mm -hmm. and veterans care. What do you see going on in that world? Um, I think there's been a lot of constructive movement uh, in the VA, but we are failing our obligation to our vets if we've got vets killing themselves every day. I think it's a broader uh, uh, indictment of our unwillingness to sort of confront openly and honestly a hard area, which is mental health. And uh, uh, you, can, you can blame the VA for a lot, but, but, but not for uh, the way we tend to hide from something that's just part of our society that we need to deal with, which are, which are the garden variety mental health issues, which are, I think, really undermining a lot of our ability to actually get the right care to, the, to, to patients who are, who are people we owe a, a, a real debt of gratitude to who served in combat defending the U.S. One of the things that I see with veterans care is you'll see these scandals from time to time and you'll see things about long waiting lists which has led to the the choice program and so on and and those are viewed in a vacuum and in, in absolute terms and if you think about you know what's the wait to get an appointment they actually track that at the VA whereas they may not track that in Boston Massachusetts or Erie Pennsylvania so you actually see it with the VA you don't know that it's actually worse with the VA than it is in the private sector no, but there's enough. I mean, I, I think there's not enough measurement involved with the private sector in general, which I think is your point. But there's just no question that uh, uh, the overwhelming, overwhelming bureaucratization of of, uh, of of healthcare. I mean, I heard the other day that the way that you do a telemedicine visit at the VA is that someone has to drive to a hospital to sit in front of a screen to talk to someone at another screen. I mean, that's the kind of just misinterpretation that, a that only a bureaucracy would provide. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to modernize and accelerate the modernization of the VA. Look, healthcare is a crappy consumer experience in general, uh, and it's our job as innovators to improve it. Um, but I think the bigger problem with the VA is not dealing with mental health and, and not ripping apart that bureaucracy and trying to modernize it faster. Well, the choice program that President Trump has extended gives vets the opportunity to seek care in the private sector if they have 
a major waiter if they're far from a, a VA facility. And I think it's interesting. I don't think it was necessarily going to solve that much. It talks about having a doctor of your choice. And as you know, it's, it's a lot harder to actually get the appointment and make it happen. There's issues with continuity of care and so on. But I'd like to see it go the other way, maybe building on my previous point. We can see who's, who's right and who's wrong here. I think it would be good to allow the VA to contract with private plans. Mm -hmm. And maybe people will actually want to go and seek care at the VA if it's done in an effective uh, in an efficient way, and, and the VA could then compete and see how well uh, their approaches work. I think it's a dumb idea. I think the, the VA doesn't do its basic job well right now. It's overwhelmed with demand, and it's been understaffed and not paid enough attention to. There's a lot of great stuff that happens to the VA, but geez, Dave, I would not want to leverage the VA, which is already overwhelmed, and actually set some, set some state records for wait times to deal with anything in the private sector. But I, I do like the fact that Trump is trying to leverage outside resources, but I think that we're a, a generation away from where we want to leverage the VA to actually try to be competitive. So it seems that you're accusing me of uh, not being in touch with reality, so I'll retreat a little bit, and let's talk about augmented reality. Okay. So that's a little bit away from you know, Medicaid and opioids. I think and, you're more into aspirations. Aspirations, that's all. So, Aspir so why not augment those? Alternative augmented reality. Yeah. We'll have that. So augmented reality, we hear a lot about it. Is it just a bunch of... Uh, Nonsense, or no? Or I, I, no I, I, actually, I actually think uh, that augmented reality is is going to be essential in the way we um, teach, train, and collaborate going forward. I, I, I actually think that there's a there's a, a there's a focus there's an overfocus on virtual reality where you kind of inhabit an entire world. Uh, a, a, a more leverageable use of augmented reality where you you take someone who's got a partial view of what's going on and you augment it with things you want to teach or train or collaborate on that, that could make a difference today. I mean, the, A, I think it's going to be very powerful in terms of, in terms of uh, healthcare training and ha training docs and nurses and caregivers, particularly where they have to work cross domains. But the other thing is there are actually uh, the diseases uh, uh, where if you have a little bit of an augmented reality support, you can gain your balance and stability back. So no, I, I, think, I think augmented reality is underestimated in terms of how quickly it's going to supplement some of, the, some of the, the, the ways we treat and the ways we train today. I think it's, it's telling that Facebook has started to embrace augmented reality after making big investments on the virtual reality side. And to me, that means it's going to be in a lot of people's hands. They'll find ways to, to work with it. And the idea of just enhancing the environment makes sense to me. I mean, I would add a couple of, of examples. I saw one that was mentioned where somebody's sort of out in the open or in a public environment, and they can spot where AEDs are around. So if somebody's mm -hmm. having a heart attack, they might be able to quickly locate mm -hmm. something in an, in, a, in an area that they're not familiar with. I also like the idea for people that have mild cognitive impairment and yep. may forget where they are or what they're doing to have some reminders uh, around the house and to just help them to guide them and allow them to stay independent. So I'm, I'm bullish on augmented reality. So we agree on that. So, but I think, I think the- For veterans or, or others. Yeah, I think, I, think, I think the thing about augmented reality, which people are missing, is we're gonna, be, we're gonna have a world without screens within a decade. Uh, we're, gonna, we're not gonna have mobile phones that we rely on. Uh, I think increasingly computer screens are going to be, be, be junked. And what you're gonna have is tools for augmented reality that pull in the kind of signals and information that we're currently leveraging our iPhones for and pulling it into our day-to-day -day experience, um, which, is, which is, is, is going to be a, a transformational experience of how we leverage technology to access information. And so it's not just the toy to, for a specific purpose, it's really the way we're gonna consume and be provided with inf actionable information um, no longer at our fingertips, but really uh, directly in front, of, in front of our eyes on demand. I think it may also be interesting, going back to your behavioral health comment, you may be able to use augmented reality to help correct some of the challenges that, uh, that people have with, uh, with behavioral health conditions and maybe to adjust the world uh, to a more normal uh, status without using medications. I think there's a lot of people who, given what's going on in D.C., would like to augment their reality and take fewer medications to deal with the, the stress of, of, of health care and coverage right now. But I, I, um, I, I, I think that, uh, again, for, for me, the powerful thing about VR and virtual reality and, and augmented reality is it's not about sort of the entertainment piece. It's actually all about information. 
And if you think about how it's going to be woven into everyday life, it starts to allow you to leverage all of the power of information without a lot of friction and with a lot, without a lot of intermediaries. And I think that could be pretty transformational for healthcare. So John, last question before we move on to the lightning round. Okay. I know we spend a lot of time in the studio with me, of course, but you're also out on the road. Been to any interesting conferences in the past month? I think uh, HES, you know, uh, Health Evolution uh, Summit, was a few weeks ago. And it was absolutely fascinating to uh, uh, bring together leaders in the plan world, entrepreneurs, entrepreneurial companies like ours at CareCentrics. And what was remarkable, David, is through all of the clutter, there's a lot of progress being made to improve and reform healthcare. You know, at CareCentrics, we're very focused on post-acute and what's happening to post-discharge. But there's just a, very, a, a rich and interesting set of alternatives for patients, plans, and providers to reform the world. And there's an enormous amount of confidence that now is the time to really bend the cost curve and improve outcomes. I honestly, I was uh, very heartened by the spirit, the ideas, and the passion that people have to do the right thing. John, you ready for the lightning round? Absolutely. Good. All right. Who's going to be the next Surgeon General? Zeke Emanuel. He, uh, a contrarian choice. He, architect of Obamacare, always available with data analytics, capable of crafting a bipartisan solution. He's our man. I don't know if that's your Eastern elitist upbringing, but I would say rather than having one of these Harvard eggheads, we should have somebody that's been running a public health department in a county or a city that's been ravaged by the opioid epidemic. So I'll say when you go high, I go low. You're just going irrelevant. And by the way, he's at the <laughs> University of Pennsylvania. Well, that's the Harvard of the, <laughs> of the Middle Atlantic. No, it's not. <laughs> All right. Lethal injection. Mm -hmm. Let's go a little further south. All right. So Arkansas decided they had some extra medications. There's let's, an upbeat healthcare topic. Let's use, let's use them up by killing a couple of inmates. And if we can't do seven, let's at least do two. Is this the end of the line for lethal injection, or are we going to see it pop up somewhere else? Uh, a quick, quick answer is no. No drug company wants to be associated with killing people. Uh, I, I think it could actually be the, close to the end of the line on, on capital punishment. It would be ironic that European drug companies were stopping our states from being able to carry out the will of the people. I think if that actually happens, you're going to see firing squads and gas chambers come back. Next topic. <laughs> All right. So what do you think is going to happen in Washington? Who's going who's to control the House come November 2018? Bad question. It's irrelevant. I mean, the reality is that who controls the House is less important than what we're talking about and what we're doing. We've got to keep moving to, from fee-for-service to fee-for-value. We've got to keep investing in innovation. And frankly, there's too much focus on, on the rhetoric and not about the reality that health care reform needs to accelerate, not decelerate what people whine about the politics. So there's been a lot of radical talk that's gone on, but really not that much has changed in, in health care. And Trump says we're going to have great health care and so on. Now, I've heard you talk about some pretty radical ideas. I want to put you on the spot and see if it's for real. Hospital at home, what's that about? Available today. We, today we can, at CareCentrics and, and other folks have shown, um, that, that up to 20% of total knee and hip replacements today could be admitted directly to home with the right level of services for the right medically stable population. There's no reason we shouldn't be uh, creating a code for that at CMS and accelerating that. Uh, and, and, and it's just, it's crazy, it's infuriating to us that where we know what to do and we can do it today, we don't have the incentives, the policies, and the support to do it. I mean, I don't think a hospital, I don't want a hospital at my home. If I'm sick and I need an IV or I need nurses and doctors looking after me, I want to be in the hospital. I want to be in my house. Second, least, second leading cause of death in, in the U.S. Increasingly, hospital-acquired infections are a problem. Hospitals are a very complex, complex place to get care. I think we need to talk to your wife. Yeah, well, I think you should put a hospital in your house. Well, the, the reality is my wife had uh, uh, a bunch of surgeries related to breast cancer a few years ago, three hospital-acquired infections into it with overnight stays. The final surgery, we, we took her directly at home, provided the services, infection-free. Talk to your wife. All right. I know better than to argue with your wife or mine, so <laughs> that's a, I think we'll end that one right there. How about drug pricing? Drug price up or down? Drug prices always go up, David. That's the reality. I think we're at a point where it's going to change. You know, I think the drug companies have done very well, and they're very continuing. well. It's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Okay. They've done ridiculously well, but there is one. Of, that's one of those issues where 
when Trump actually realizes the Freedom Caucus are not his friends, then this is a chance to pivot to something that's truly bipartisan, allows you to pick a fight with a bad guy, and actually introduce drug price controls. That's what I expect to see. Not going to happen. There are good guys and bad guys and bad actors who just jack up the prices in areas like generics or conventional drugs. But the problem is you need to protect the, the innovative companies, and there's no easy way to do it. I think, I think, it, I think that's a simplistic answer, David. All right, John. Well, I've always been uh, known for my, uh, my simplistic responses. So with that, I'm going to point right here to our screen and urge everybody to press that button and subscribe to our Care Talk videocast. We love that. And John, I want to say thank you very much. I'm David Williams from Health Business Group, John Driscoll, CEO of CareCentrics. That's it for now. Thanks for joining.